So hopefully you see a slide. Uh, good. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, people sometimes ask, like, what does it mean, the neuroscience of free will? How do you study that? Um, the honest question is, we don't really study free will in, in neuroscience, but we study various questions that have, that potentially have a bearing on, on uh, uh, the question of free will uh, and, that, and that conversation. And in particular, uh, the research that I've done uh, and others ha have been doing for many years focuses on uh, the initiation of action. Uh, and in particular, the spontaneous initiation of action um, for, for various reasons that uh, uh, has long been deemed to be closer to the topic of free will than initiating an action, for example, in, re in response to a stimulus, right? Um, now, at, at least in, in neuroscientific circles, the question of free will, uh, and I think in philosophy as well, is, is, a, is a very difficult one and, and in some ways a very divisive one. Kind of you, you either have it or you don't, uh, according to the many. Now, these two quotes, these are two of my favorites. And of course, they're meant to be a bit, uh, almost a bit humorous, but they expose, I think, uh, this idea that, look, you either have it or you don't. Um, you either believe you have it or, or you don't believe that you have it. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there's been a lot of research in neuroscience going back to uh, the 1960s um, that at least people have thought has a bearing on questions of free will. Um, and in particular, I think one of, one of the biggest and most enduring questions has been, you know, can can we predict your behavior? Um, and, and if we can predict your behavior, does that undermine uh, free will in, in some way or another? Um, and, and it goes a bit deeper than that, right? Can we predict your behavior even before you know what you're gonna do? Um, questions like that, of course, have have been uh, 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 have generated a lot of a lot of controversy, and so I'm going to try and speak to them. The idea to those kinds of questions to sort of arm you with the background knowledge that you need to confront s some of this data and some of the interpretations of the data, uh, which I'll argue in the, in this talk. Some of those interpretations I think have been just outright wrong. So. Before I get into the science, just a couple of my own personal guiding principles, especially in in this area, um, it's it's a it's a different kind of question than asking, for example, how does the retina, uh, uh, you know, process incoming light. Um, I think that the questions of things like consciousness and free will these are very very important questions to us as human beings. And so one has to be, I think the bar has to be higher uh, for ma making any kind of pronouncements um, for that reason. And so for me, I think the first guiding principle as a scientist and, and, and I think in, in general is humility. Um, there's just a lot that we don't know and, and what we do know is, is, is a very, very tiny little speck compared to what we don't know. Um, at the same time though, uh, it's important to have a certain amount of authority and confidence um, regarding, first of all, the few things that we are pretty sure that we know, uh, uh, but especially regarding what we do not know, right? Um, it's, it's, it's good to start out being confident about that. Now, I'm not a philosopher, um, but I know enough about philosophy uh, to feel pretty confident that I'm I'm not just uh, 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 spinning my wheels scientifically, that I'm not just chasing after the wrong kinds of questions, right? Um, now there, there are lots of different conceptions uh, of free will. Um, there are several flavors of incompatibilism, uh, the idea that you know the, the universe is deterministic and the idea of the, the very notion of free will is just simply incom incompatible with that. Um, uh, with that reality. There's also a, 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 the counterpoint to that called compatibilism. There's idea promoted by some, Dan, Dan, the psychologist Dan Wegner, for example, uh, citing that free will is really just an illusion. Um, there's the notion of free will uh, from, from uh, Thomas Aquinas, which I'm sure many here are, are 
very familiar with, and, and many, many more. Um, the, the science, at least what I'm going to discuss, um, speaks mainly, I think, to issues around determinism, right? Uh, um, and, and incompatibilism. That is to say, you know, can we predict your behavior? Um, and if we can, or to the extent that we can, how do we interpret that? What does that mean? Um, so that's primarily what this talk is about. It's about what I would call conscious volition. And the question is, do our conscious willings, at least sometimes, have a direct causal relationship with our actions? Um, and we take that up, as I mentioned before, primarily in the context of what we call self-initiated or spontaneous voluntary actions. Uh, so um, rather than the kind of action that's depicted on the left, where we're reacting to an incoming stimulus, um, you would hope, and for example, if, if you're familiar with baseball or even, or cricket, um, you know, as the ball is coming towards you, you, you had better hope that you're reacting to the ball uh, and that the ball is driving your actions, right? Because you want to hit it. Um, what I have depicted on the right is what we call T-ball. This is how we start kids off, uh, children off in, in baseball. But what's interesting about T-ball is that you stand the kid there and, and you're not reacting to, to, a, to a stimulus. It's, you, it's, up, you know, it's up to you when you swing the bat, right? Um, it's in your hands. So, um, the kind of research that 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 uh, I'll be talking about today is is more along the lines of of what's depicted on the right, you know? um, actions that we initiate more or less spontaneously, more or less voluntarily. I think one of the one of the most important points to bring up at the outset um, is that the feeling of willing and the 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 neural mechanics that in, that that lead to action are separate in the brain. Um, and that is a bit hard to wrap your head around, um, but that's been, uh, that's something that was, uh, uh, dates back to um, the, the studies of Benjamin Libet in the 1980s, suggesting that, um, you know, our, the, the brain seemed to be preparing to act even before we know that we're, even before we consciously are aware of our intention to act. Um, now I'm I I have some serious doubts about that particular interpretation, um, but Libet's studies opened up the idea, exposed the idea that the feeling of intending and the mechanisms that generate action might be different things. Um, and since then, we have very solid data uh, uh, that that they are in fact different, and and there are different regions of the brain that are involved. Um, in these couple of uh, studies by uh, Desmerger, uh, these came uh, from France. Um, these were actual uh, stimulation studies. So these were patients undergoing surgery uh, for other reasons. But during the surgery, they had permission to stimulate parts of, uh, of the brain. And interestingly, and I'm really just summarizing here, but um, stimulating to a part of the brain uh, called the posterior parietal cortex uh, reliably induced in the patient the feeling of an urge to move. Uh, and at, at stronger intensities, that stimulation led uh, not only to the urge to move, but to the subject declaring, I, I just moved, um, when in fact they hadn't. Uh, whereas stimulation to areas of the frontal cortex and, and the motor area of the brain uh, could provoke actual movements without the subject even knowing that they had moved uh, or feeling that they're, they had an intention to move. Um, so I say that's hard to wrap your head around. It's just because in everyday life, we really feel that our movements and our intentions are just locked together. And that's because they are. Uh, the brain is designed uh, uh, very beautifully so that um, those two things uh, are, are very tightly linked. We want them to be. Um, but they are distinct. Uh, that, that seems quite clear 
Um, there is, by the way, uh, uh, there's another area of the frontal lobe where if you stimulate there, um, you get both. So you get movements and uh, the feeling of the urge to move. So this whole area of research, looking at what actually causes movements to happen versus uh, what's involved in feeling the urge or the or the intention to move, um, dates back actually to a study, uh, uh, now uh, uh, a classic study from 1965 by Kornhuber and Deka. Um, they wanted to study uh, movement uh, without a, 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 a stimulus, without a cue telling the person to move. So until then, you know, most all uh, research on initiating movement involved a, a, a cue, right, a, a stimulus. So there's a stimulus and you respond. I said, well, what happens when there's no stimulus? I mean, sometimes you just, you know, get up and go make yourself a sandwich, right? Um, or, or I pick up my my cup of coffee and take a, a another sip. Um, there's no, you know, there's no bell that rings or light that blinks that says do that now. So they asked their subjects to perform uncued movements, just sort of whenever you want. They 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 asked them try and avoid being rhythmic. Um, leave some time in between movements just so that we can look at the brain data that we're recording. And what they revealed in the uh, in the EEG data um, was, uh, let's see, laser pointer, um, this very slow ramping signal uh, over the motor areas of the brain recorded using electroencephalography, this slow ramping signal that started almost a second before the movement and slowly ramped up and reached a peak right at here, this is time zero. This is the time that the movement was executed. Um, and these, I point out, are averages, right? They do many, many movements, and they align them to the time of the movement and then average it together to reveal this signal, right? And Kornhuber and Deka dubbed this uh, the uh, Bereitschafts potential in German or the readiness potential in English, um, and, and thought of it as the electrophysiological sign of planning preparation and initiation, initiation of volitional acts. Um, and that interpretation have, has held broadly since then. Um, now this, this signal that's recorded uh, via electroencephalography, via EEG electrodes placed on the scalp is actually a reflection of, of neural activity uh, underneath. And that neural activity has been recorded directly uh, in, in at least one study uh, and shown to build up uh, in much the same way. So, so the firing of individual neurons in motor areas, uh, or well, these are pre-motor areas, um, build up uh, prior to the moment uh, of uh, initiation of the movement. So this, re what, what's called the readiness potential when, when it's recorded using EEG, um, just reflects a more general pre-movement buildup of neural activity um, that is rather slowish, right? A, a second, this is a thousand milliseconds here. The, so this is a full second. And on, on neural time scales, that's a very, very long time. That same buildup in advance of self-initiated movements has been recorded uh, and well-documented in, in other species, primates, uh, rodents, and even crayfish. Um, and interestingly, with with crayfish, I mean, they're not even vertebrates, and, and they don't even have cortex, let alone motor cortex. Um, but they do exhibit a slow buildup of neural activity, uh, preceding transitions from rest to foraging. Right? So the finding of this, uh, this pre-movement buildup um, led... Uh, Benjamin Libet in the 1980s uh, to devise this experiment where, you know, he he recorded uh, electroencephalography uh, and had subjects perform spontaneous movements, but at the same time uh, he had them monitor this clock that was a small dot that would go around this clock. It wasn't a regular clock, so this would go around every three seconds. The dot would move quickly around the clock every three seconds. Um, 
that's about 50 milliseconds per per second on the clock. And just ask subjects to make a spontaneous movement when they wanted to, but then to um, report back where was that dot when they felt the urge to move. And they were they were carefully instructed. This is not about when you moved; it's about when you felt the urge to move. Um, and the now famous or infamous uh, result of that ex experiment was that, um, you know, here's when they moved right here at the peak of this readiness potential. Um, on average, their decision time clocks in at about, you know, 200 milliseconds before the movement. Um, and yet you can see this readiness potential stretching much farther back in time than that. So the the upshot of this or the way it was interpreted was that uh, you know your brain seems to be getting ready to move before you even are aware of your conscious decision to move and how of course can that how can that be compatible with uh, free will so it generated a lot of controversy right um, this is a caricature of that classical view of the readiness potential I think of it as like the, the way it's it's been interpreted is like knocking over some dominoes so it's like, look, that's it. You've you've knocked over the first domino. It's just a matter of time, and then you're going to move. And this signal reflects uh, the outcome of a decision. Your brain's made a decision. Hey, I'm going to move in a, like a one second or so, which, by the way, is a ridiculously long time, but fine. Uh, right? And And then somewhere quite late in the game is when the self becomes conscious of the decision to move. Now, all of this is very fraught, like trying to measure the time when you feel an urge to move is also very fraught. It's being criticized in, in, a, in a thousand different ways. Um, I, I, what I'm going to talk about here in the first half of the talk is just a, a challenge to the basic fundamental interpretation of what this readiness potential thing even means. Um, and that's important, I think, because no one ever bothered to ask. They just assumed that it reflected the brain getting ready to move and off they went. Um, and that's led, that general theme has led to a bunch of different studies. So this is Libet's study, but we've had studies from my colleague, John Dylan Haynes, uh, looking at, you know, predicting free choices uh, uh, using fMRI several seconds in advance. and. Uh, and this replication of Libet study using uh, uh, implanted electrodes in the motor cortex. Um, so this the, the Libet finding replicates well, so I'm not going to challenge that. But uh, the important thing, I think, is the interpretation. Um, and one important thing to, to, to keep in mind, and here's a, a quote, when push comes to shove, uh, from from my colleague John Dylan Haynes is that if you if you believe that the brain is governed by the laws of nature and that our decisions are realized by our brain, um, then our decisions should not be completely unrelated to brain activity ongoing in the recent past. Right? It would it would kind of be strange if they weren't. Um, and the important thing about these studies using fMRI to to predict free decisions and so on is that it, it's all in the word predict, right? Um, what what really happened in those studies was that a machine learning algorithm was able to correctly classify the upcoming movement slightly better than a coin toss, right? So a coin toss is, would be 50%, and they were at like 58, 60%. Um, that, in my mind, doesn't really count as a prediction, right? It's not like we predicted your your, what you're going to decide. It's just that we've caught a we, we've caught a glimpse of some of the preconditions in the brain that go into that decision, and it stands to reason that there should be something, right? Um, uh, if those decisions are realized in your brain, in spite of the messiness of all of this research, um, and 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 the fact that you know we 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 really made conclusions of, uh, and just sort of accepted an interpretation of what the readiness potential means and what these other signals mean without a, a, ever asking, right? Um, in spite of all that, we, we get this in 2016 in the Atlantic, sort of based on all of this research, there's no such thing as, as free will. Um, and, and this is an example of what I mean by, you know, 
the importance of setting the bar relatively high when it comes to these kinds of uh, questions. I mean, this, in my mind, well, nobody believes this anymore. This was just very, very premature and, and, uh, and, and a lot driven by, I think, hype, right? Because the data just, the, the data just weren't there and, and the interpretations had never really been challenged. Uh, as they sh always should be in, in science. Um, but this is Libet's paradox, right? Um, this is where most of this started. And the paradox is just how can purposeful movement causing brain activity begin before the conscious decision to initiate the movement has even emerged? And that's Libet's paradox. Fair enough, right? There seems, that seems to be uh, uh, what's going on? Well, one possible answer um, that never really was considered is that the activity just isn't purposeful and doesn't reflect the primary cause of movement. Um, and that's what I've argued in my studies on the readiness potential, and I'll, 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 I'll briefly explain that um, to you here. But first, I want to I want to um, make clear what we do know and what's well established about the red this signal the readiness potential and this pre-movement buildup so the readiness potential per se is a signal visible in eeg prior to spontaneous voluntary movements when those eeg traces are time aligned to movement onset and averaged over many epochs so it's an it's 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 a it's a phenomenon that is really visible in the average, in the aggregate. Um, there's significant variability across individuals in this thing, and it's very difficult to resolve in single trials. Just to give you a flavor of that, um, here's data from a few of my subjects just showing you kind of the, 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 the vari variability in uh, the shape and, and time course of these readiness potentials. So you got some subjects where like this one, where the, the data were particularly noisy, okay? Um, but just look at all of these. I mean, with the exception of subject seven, none of them really looks like this canonical readiness potential that you get in the group average, which is what we tend to, to look at. Um, and uh, what people, fail to mention very often is that somewhere around 20% of, of subjects or more um, don't even exhibit a readiness potential. And we, we don't know why, um, but they're still able to move uh, and, 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 and do so spontaneously, right? Um, this thing is difficult to resolve in single trials. It's, it's especially with EEG. Now, I, I, I admit with intracranial brain recordings, of course, the signal to noise ratio is much, much better. And then you can see these things on single trials. Um, but with EEG, it's very difficult. So here's a single trial. You can't make anything out of it. Here's 10 trials. By about 50 trials, you start to have something that you might be able to recognize. And here's after 200 trials, right? Um, this is just to give you an idea of the, the, the signal to noise ratio. This black line in the middle is the actual average. This is the average RP, but all this white mess out here. This, these are the actual individual trials that went into calculating that average. So it's a very tiny signal um, that we managed to recover uh, from, from very noisy data. Um, most people agree that this RP has at least two stages. There's this late stage that's more tied to motor processes, like literally sending a motor signal down your spinal cord to your muscles to tell them to flex. And then there's this long, slow, very early signal that's thought to reflect uh, 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 pre activity in pre-motor uh, cortex um, that according to Libet's interpretation is, is the brain getting ready to move, right? So I wanna challenge that idea that the RP reflects the brain getting ready to move uh, with an alternative view. Um, and the idea is, is, is pretty simple at its core. So the idea is that um, at some, some level, there must be a threshold in your motor system uh, 
that has to be exceeded in some sense for a volley of action potentials to then be sent to your muscle to tell them to move. Um, this is the way neurons work. It's the way populations of neurons work. There's there there's a nonlinear threshold, and then when if you reach that threshold, then something happens, right? Um, so what if the activity leading up to that threshold um, has is characterized by being very noisy, uh, such that the precise moment at which the threshold is is crossed is largely determined by just random fluctuations, just the random ebb and flow uh, of the underlying neural activity um, and not any kind of a, a specific decision, right? Well, that kind of view would require that we have spontaneous fluctuations in neural activity that are sort of ongoing. Um, and th that's an easy yes, so we do. We know that uh, populations of neurons uh, recorded in various ways or recordings from EEG, uh, even when you're doing nothing, uh, they're characterized by this kind of slowly fl fluctuating noise. Uh, and the kind of noise you see is this, what we call pink noise or autocorrelated noise. It's not white noise like what I have shown below. Uh, it's this flavor of noise that's dominated by slower drifts. Right. The gist of this explanation is that uh, while the fact of having moved may have been partly driven by your intentions, the precise moment that the movement emerged uh, may have been at least partly determined by these slow fluctuations that are really just noise. Right. And that if you time a line to the moment of uh, movement execution, that's the moment that the threshold was crossed. And so you're guaranteed to pick up this slow, gradual ramping up, uh, even though it, it doesn't mean anything about you, your brain having made any kind of a decision, right? Decision didn't happen until the threshold was crossed. So this is called this, I, I've called this the stochastic decision model. Here, there are really two premises. One is that the brain uses the same mechanism for decision-making in a task like Libet's as it would in any decision-making task. And that's accumulation of evidence up to a threshold. In this case, there's no evidence because you're not doing a sensory task. You're just asked to move kind of whenever you feel like it. Um, nevertheless, that same, according to this premise, that same mechanism has to be at work. Uh, and so the answer is that it's driven by noise, partly at least, uh, plus a weak imperative to move. And that weak imperative to move just comes from the demand characteristics of the task. The fact that you know, the, the participant in the experiment knows that he or she is there to perform movements every so often. So even though I give them this instruction that they can move whenever they want to, uh, they never wait more than about at the very longest 30 seconds to move, right? Even though, I mean, the instruction is clear, like they could never move if they want to, they, they could just sit there the whole time or they could wait five minutes if they wanted to, right? But they don't, right? They on average wait less than 10 seconds. So there is this imperative that's just unspoken. So if you, if you combine that weak imperative with a lot of, with uh, internal noise, then you, you can have this scenario where you have a threshold crossing that is driven by the combination of the two, but the slow drift and noise actually played a big role in determining precisely when. And that may be part of why the movements can actually feel spontaneous. The other premise is that when the imperative to produce that movement is weak, as it is in this kind of task, right? The, the imperative is relatively I'm not telling you exactly when to move, right? I'm just telling you kind of move when you feel like it. So that's not a very strong imperative. So when the imperative to produce a movement is weak, then the precise moment at which that decision threshold is crossed is largely determined by spontaneous subthreshold fluctuations in neural activity. And those fluctuations end up in the event locked average as a gradual buildup. 
So that's the upshot of that model. And you know, for those, I'm not going to go into the math or anything here, but we built we built a com computational model, which is a very standard model used in decision making. Uh, it's it's an accumulation to bound model. Um, it's called a leaky stochastic accumulator. And with that model and this basic idea, we were able to to fit the behavioral data and the EEG data um, exceedingly well. Right. So and we also made a novel prediction based on that model and tested it, and it turned out to, to, to be confirmed. So this is a sort of new perspective that I've offered on the readiness potential that all what's going on very early on that we thought was the brain's decision to move is really just spontaneous ongoing noise fluctuations in the motor system. Um, and that the actual deciding factor the decision of when to move happens very close in time to the movement, about 150 milliseconds before where this presumptive threshold is crossed. Interestingly, that coincides pretty nicely with right about when Libet's subjects thought they felt their urge to move. Um, so Libet's mistake might have been to just not take his uh, participants at their word. Right? When they said that was when I felt like it decided, maybe that really was when the brain decided, right? That they were coincident in time. And there's been a, a lot of support for the model uh, since we introduced it. Um, one quote that I like uh, from Murakami et al. kind of summarizes the idea saying that um, bounded integration models identify the initial intention to act as the moment of threshold crossing while explaining how antecedent subthreshold neural activity can influence an action without implying a decision. Right, right, most important. So in summary, that this uh, stochastic decision model accounts for the electrophysiological, behavioral, and subjective variables in Libet's task. It argues for a late commitment to move in spontaneous self-initiated movements. Um, and it allows that the conscious intention has a meaningful and reasonably precise relationship with the actual neural decision to move. Um, and as an aside, it also suggests that a pre-event buildup might be a general phenomenon in nature rather than something specific to the human brain, right? We've, I, I've, I've collaborated uh, uh, with someone in finance looking for this kind of buildup in, in financial markets, right? Anywhere that you have a threshold and autocorrelated or slowly fluctuating noise, um, you, 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 ex you would expect to see this kind of pre-event buildup. W one criticism or one comment I get very often is that, oh, are you saying that our movements are just noise, a result of noise, right? Um, and that's a straw man. Look, uh, obviously, no, I'm not saying that. Nobody's saying that. Um, if, they w if, it, if that were the case, you'd just be making random movements all the time, right? Um, which some people with certain neurological conditions do that, but uh, uh, normally, no, right? Um, the point is that um, ongoing noise in your motor system is likely to play more of a role when you're on this end of the spectrum here where the time of your movement is, is not externally constrained, right? Um, and re likely to play a relatively small role in these conditions where your movement is really constrained by, ex by external stimuli, right? Um, and in tasks like Libet's task, uh, it, it's, it's quite unconstrained, right? You're asked, it, it's almost artificially un unconstrained. You're asked to like, quote unquote, be spontaneous, right? Well, in that circumstance, how is a brain to decide when to move, right? The brain's, I mean, you've been asked, you've been given a task, move your finger sort of whenever you want. That's your task. Kind of don't, you know, be random, be spontaneous. People do it. Like they come into the lab, they do it. They figure out how to do it. Well, the question is, how does a brain do that? How do you break the symmetry and say, okay, fine, I'm going to move now. This gives one solution, right? That background noise in your brain plays a bit of a role. 
Um, so I'd like to then, um, having offered this alternate expl uh, explanation, interpretation of the readiness potential, talk about some other research I've been doing um, where we're trying to look at, look, how, how predictable is movement onset really? Right, because the, the whole issue behind the readiness potential and its relationship to the urge to move was that it seems like you know your movements were actually uh, uh, preempted or pre predicted by this readiness potential that was you know coming online even before you felt the urge to move. Well, doing a study like this. Uh, scientifically, ideally, you'd want to take some data epochs without movement and some data e epochs with movement, and then you want to compare them. Right? That's just standard science. Um, but in this domain of spontaneous voluntary movement, we don't have these epochs without movement. Right? We don't know where they are because nothing happened. These we know, we know how to find them in the data because we, we set a marker in the data that says this is when the movement happened. So all, literally all of the research on self-initiated movement has operated just in this domain. We take the op epochs with the movement and we time align to the onset of the movement and look at what happened in advance. Um, unlike in most uh, domains, we don't have this control condition. It's just not there, right? Um, sometimes we compare what's happening at the time of the movement with what happened a few seconds before, right? You can do that. But that's still within this, you know, set of, of, of epochs, the set of data that all ended with a movement. And just to give you an, a, an idea of why that might be misguided, um, imagine trying to learn how to predict, say, something like rainfall uh, based on a sample of only rainy days, right? You're, that's, that's a biased sample. You're unlikely to learn what you need to learn to actually predict rain, because a lot of the time it doesn't rain, right? What's happening then? So to try and get at this question, um, I, I've been working in collaboration. This is uh, with my PhD student, Luca, with Rob Shapire, uh, formerly at Princeton, now at Microsoft Research, um, who uh, it, uh, developed the Adaboost machine learning algorithm and his uh, former PhD student, Mehmet. And the idea was to literally try to map the time course of neural activity predictive of impending movement. So what we did, uh, we used a very, very simple uh, paradigm where we just showed people a, a, a slideshow of pretty pictures of nature, just so they wouldn't get bored. Um, and we told them, well, there, there are two ways to advance to the next slide. One is manually and the other is automatically. And before a slide appears, you'll see a prompt and it'll tell you if this is a manual one or an automatic one. If it's manual, then it's up to you to just, you know, enjoy the pretty picture and then when you're ready just press the button and it'll advance to the next one but if you if you see the prompt the automatic prompt that means that the next slide you just passively wait and it'll advance after a little bit by itself now importantly the viewing time on these automatic trials was drawn from the subject's own viewing time distribution on the manual trials so that by the end of the experiment, these two kind of epochs were pretty well matched in terms of how long uh, you waited. So now what we can do is we can align not to the movement, but to the slide transition. And this gives us now our match control condition where we have data epochs that end with a slide transition, but no movement and another set of data epochs that end with the slide transition and movement, right? Now, these might be slightly different in other ways, right? But that would only, that would only make our claim actually stronger uh, in what, I'll, I'll, what we're 
going to do. And what we're going to do is we're going to take these two sets of data here and build a machine learning classifier that we're going to apply in a sliding window. So it's a window of about 500, half a second wide. And we start that window way back in time and move it one step at a time. And at each step of the window, we're asking the classifier, this machine learning algorithm, can you tell whether this is a manual one or an automatic one? And we're going to trace out the accuracy of that, of that uh, uh, classification, right? A lot, being careful, by the way, to align to the leading edge of that window so that we are sure we don't have any information from the future, right? That, that, that could give us an unfair edge, right? Well, what happens when we do that, here, you, here is a, a, a video showing that. Um, let's hope, hopefully the, uh, um, this will work. So uh, this white area here is the window, the sliding window. Um, and the green and the blue lines, those are just two features that, signal features that the, the machine learning classifier picked up on. They're just two examples, one from the manual side of things and the other from the automatic side. Um, the important thing though is to note the relationship between this sliding window and this curve over here called the ROC curve. And that ROC curve measures gives you an idea of how well the classifier is doing. Um, if it's right along this diagonal here, it means it's just guessing. So it's just doesn't know anything. Um, but if this curve gets pushed up into the upper left corner here, that's optimal. That's like it's doing perfect job, right? It, it's, it's always getting them right. So let's see if I can um, play this. I have to get my pointer back. laser pointer. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, so this goes a little bit quickly, so pay attention. Um, ready, set, go. So, and watch the red line, and you see when it lurches up into the corner. I'm not sure if this is optimized for video playback, but did everybody see that? I, I, it was good, but maybe one more time. Yep, I was going to run it again anyway. So, again, watch the sliding window and where the leading edge of the window is in relation to when this curve you know, goes up into the upper left-hand corner. So the classifier does it a really excellent job of distinguishing uh, uh, manual from automatic data epochs, but only, only at the very last few, uh, like, the last 100 or 150 milliseconds before the movement. Um, so if we just average this out, you get this blue line here. This is the performance of the classifier uh, aligned to the leading edge of that window. And unlike what the readiness potential would suggest, um, the, our ability to distinguish between when a movement is going to happen and when it's not going to happen doesn't really uh, uh, go anywhere in, until very close to the time of movement. Now this red line here, this is when we cheat. This is when we look at only the uh, data epochs that end in a movement. And we compare them, basically compare them to themselves, but at an earlier point in time. So this would make us think that we could classify very, very well very early on. But in fact, when, when we include the actual control condition, we clearly cannot, uh, in spite of the fact that this readiness potential here, recorded from some of the very same data, can sort of string back in time a whole second or, or even two seconds, right? Um, so this state of affairs is very consistent with this explanation that this is really uh, largely uh, noise um, that isn't uh, a deciding factor in the initiation of the of the movement. Now, um, we're still working on some of these things, and one of the future directions that we're working on uh, is to do something called uh, forecasting, 
time unlocked forecasting where we don't uh, break the data up into into epochs aligned to the movement. We just look at the entire time series of the data and try to build a forecast, just like in a weather forecast. What's the probability of movement in the future given the state of the brain now and in the recent past, right? Um, and ask, so how well can we can we forecast? Um, and those distributions look something like what I have here on the background, um, where you have on the vertical, the state of some variable, and, and then on the horizontal, you have time in the future, right? And, and then color gives you probability. Um, and this is something that we could apply across different species and across different levels of analysis. Um, but it does require a high uh, uh, signal to noise. And so we're working on applying this uh, in collaboration with other scientists who work with patients who have implanted electrodes in their motor cortex. Um, so just one uh, quick postscript uh, before I wrap up. Um, you know, what would count as evidence against conscious volition? I've argued that a, a lot of this evidence that we thought was evidence against conscious volition really isn't. Um, but then the question, had, okay, so what would count? Um, if you could consistently predict action well in advance, several seconds, with very high accuracy, so say 99%, then we'd have something to talk about. But there, there is no such evidence. Right, there just isn't, um, and and it's an open question of whether that's even possible in a system uh, like the brain, right? Um, but we these situations where you have these kind of electrode arrays directly implanted in the brain of patients, it's becoming more and more common, and so I think we're going to see coming soon a wave of research with much higher signal to noise ratio that may start to push up against some of these uh, possibilities, um, maybe. But again, I would argue that a single brain is, is way more complex than the entirety of the Earth's atmosphere. And look at how good we are at predicting the weather, right? Um, so that remains to be seen. Um, another quick plug, I'll, I'll wrap up here, um, is, uh, you know, there, there are other kinds of evidence. This book recently came out by Robert Sapolsky called Determined. Now, he certainly is, is very much on the side of there is no free will. Um, but this is worth reading because it's well researched. And it's good to understand these arguments, which are not based on neuroscience, but based just on statistics. Um, I think one answer to these kind of, one possible answer to these kind of um, challenges is that acts of free will are relatively rare in everyday life. And so that in a lot of these circumstances or a lot of these contexts where we study it, we're, we're looking at the wrong examples, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, just you pick up your coffee and take the next sip. I doubt that qualifies as an act of free will. Um, but when we study things in the lab, that's very often the kind of circumstances that we set up. Um, so I'll leave I'll leave it with that and and open it up for discussion. Thank you very much for your uh, attention.